you for having me here tonight, Prime Minister, and thank you for uh, joining us. I have to begin with the uh, obvious big question, given what's happening in the Middle East, given what's happening in Ukraine, the South China Sea, U.S. economy, so-so, Europe in the doldrums, Latin America now, turbulent and Brazilian election. So, what is your assessment of the global economy, then Asia, and then Singapore in particular? Well, the world is never completely at peace. I think if you look at it historically, these are peaceful times, <clears throat> but of course there are turbulent issues all over in different parts of the world. Uh, the American economy, you know better than me, is on, statistically is a very long recovery, but it's also a very weak one. I think the Europeans are in the doldrums, and not just secretly, but because of structural issues which will take quite some time to resolve here. Uh, in Asia, there's strong new governments in India, in China. I think they want to make fundamental reforms. It will take some time, but they are uh, going at it. And in Southeast Asia, well, we are trying to get our act together. We are talking about an ASEAN community by the end of next year. We are doing business with the rest of the world. Some of us are involved with the TPP, which is a big thing for us. And we hope to prosper when China prospers and if peace continues. In the world. You see, uh, uh, talking about the turbulence in the world, international law, what are the prospects that these flare ups are going to uh, be contained? I think it uh, varies from place to place. I mean, the uh, Ukrainian issue is a, has become much more complicated because of MH17. Um, but the Europeans have a lot of business done with the Russians, and they don't want to go to war with the Russians. So this will remain an issue, but I don't think they're going to. It is going to lead to a global conflagration. In Asia, we have disputes. We have the South China Sea disputes between China and several of the ASEAN states, Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei. Uh, there is a dispute over the Senkaku between China and Japan. Um, I think the temperature has gone up on both. Uh, they are not easy to resolve, but I, again, I don't think that either side wants to push it to the brink. It's a game of brinksmanship, and we have to hope that there are no mishaps and that same council series. But I don't see those issues being solved quickly because sovereignty is involved, because national pride is involved, because uh, there's a social media in the countries which work up sentiments. And nobody can pull back and say, I made a mistake or I made a deal and I've decided to cut the island. It's not going to happen. So all we can do is to live with the disagreements and manage it, and hope that our grandchildren will be wiser than us and can make progress on it. Grandchildren, my goodness. <laughs> um, it's a long way. Uh, in, in, in the meantime, uh, what should the role of the United States be in trying to make sure these, these disputes don't escalate? I think or rise in the first place. Well, the U.S. is not omnipotent. Uh, you are the superpower, in a way the only superpower, but you cannot order things in the world as you wish, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in Ukraine, whether it's in Asia. But you have a constructive and important role to play because you've got friends all over the world and you can do things which, and play a role which no other country can. In Asia, America has played a vital role since the war. And it's a Pacific power. Obama has said it, it, it will remain a Pacific power. And I think any US administration has to say. It. But you have also got preoccupations in many other places. So if you were, whoever is a Secretary of State, he is on the jet a million kilometers a year, and all continents. So to be able to focus on Asia, to tend your relationships, 
maintain good ties with China, make sure you make, keep up with your friends, other friends in Asia, and be present constructively. But you have interests, and everybody knows you have interests, and I think you have a legitimate role to play because many countries in Asia welcome America's presence and have deep ties with America. You uh, mentioned Asia. Uh, how do you see that uh, moving in the future now in terms of uh, cooperation, integration, and uh, removing barriers? I mentioned the ASEAN community. We have a target of N2015 for achieving this ASEAN community, and particularly the economic community, which means uh, free trade in goods, which means freer trade in services, which means uh, better rules for investments, which means more rationalization of uh, regulations and, and uh, civil aviation so that we can connect with one another better. I think that we have an ambitious roadmap. We probably will make, we've made about 80% of it already. But the last 20% of course are the hardest parts, uh, most politically sensitive. So I'm sure that there will be work left over to be done even after we have an economic community. But we will make progress and we're heading in the right direction. Our countries have different preoccupations. I mean, you always do. There's a new government in Indonesia. I think the new president will be focused on domestic issues for a while. Um, Thailand is, uh, has, a military, has a military government which is working towards establishing new rules and eventually holding new elections. So, Myanmar is uh, still in the process of democratic transition, working towards an election next year, which I think will uh, be a significant test of whether democracy can work in the country. So we've all got different preoccupations, but I think that we are gradually making progress together. Uh, it's not like the European Union, which aims for a single market and a single community in all respects, but even the Europeans don't find it simple to be single in all respects. So I think that we have a realistic, even though study less ambitious target. Will the time ever come where you'll have a single currency? Or will you Pro Europe is saying no? Probably after my retirement. <laughs> <laughs> the Europeans uh, have asked themselves very seriously whether they should have gone into a single currency and if you took a purely economic view of it, the answer probably was no, but they had other reasons for doing it. In, uh, in Asia, the preconditions don't arise, uh, uh, do not exist. I mean, the, you don't have that same congruence of the system, you don't have the integration of the economies, you don't have a similar basis for even economic policy, Maybe, and, and for integrating the economies. If you are going to have a single currency in Asia, the simple question is, is it going to be based on the renminbi or is it based on the yen? That answers that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, getting, uh, getting here to uh, Singapore, uh, everyone knows the amazing progress Singapore has made over the years in the periodic of crises here in a country with uh, five and a half how do you uh, maintain, first of all, your preeminence, certainly uh, centrality as a financial center, and uh, how do you make sure you maintain and enhance your global influence with five and a half million people? Well, I think that we just try to do okay for ourselves. Uh, it's a continuing challenge. Um, at every level, you have not arrived, and you have to find new ways to move ahead. And we're at a level now where we have five and a half million people in Singapore. And we say we have to grow, but you have to grow by upgrading the workers, upgrading our own people, so that they can do better jobs, earn higher pay, and improve their lives. The population has to expand some, uh, gradually, in a sustainable way. Talent has to be able to come into Singapore so that we will create more wealth and we can generate more business and more good jobs for the people. But fundamentally, we have to upgrade and transform our economy and our people.
people, the young ones in schools, and also those not so young who are already working, but who need to refresh their skills and who need to pick up new capabilities because the world is changing. And that is a big challenge. It's a challenge which all the developed countries face. Uh, we are at developed country levels of income and GDP, but in fact, we're not quite at developed country levels in terms of the comprehensiveness of our economy, in terms of having the multinationals, the reach. So people look at us and they say, yes, you are doing well, but we are still a small country even though we're doing well. And we never forget that. Uh, one of the challenges you faced was a growing population infrastructure not growing as quickly to meet that uh, surge of immigration. Now you seem to have a situation today where wages are growing faster than productivity. How do you uh, ride this tiger? How do you try to point in this? Well, there are several, several aspects of that. First of all, uh, we fell behind on infrastructure because the economy was doing well and we just needed the, the workers at all levels, whether construction workers, whether uh, factory workers, whether they are uh, uh, service workers in hotels, whether they are professionals or bankers. And they came in and, well, they put a load on us. I think if we had not brought them in and shut them off, we would have faced other serious problems. But the infrastructure shortfall was a problem, and we've been building houses, I think we've caught up now, we've been uh, improving our expanding our metro or train system. Uh, not quite caught up, but it's in progress and we are seeing improvements already. Uh, so I think the infrastructure problems can be resolved. The challenge really is how do we upgrade ourselves and grow not so much with so many people coming in, but with higher quality growth. And as you say, in recent years, wages have gone up faster than uh, productivity. Uh, I think in the short term you can wear that, and in the short term it, I think it's okay because um, the demand is there, the, people, uh, the, the pressure to come into Singapore to invest, to set up companies is there, and therefore Singaporeans are in demand. And that's, if that's the value of the Singaporean, I think it's good that they get it. And they are really getting that bonus from being Singaporean because people want to come to Singapore and I happen to be a Singaporean, therefore, well, I enjoy a wage which I would not get if I was somewhere else in Southeast Asia. And th in fact, that's one of the ways we want to improve the wages of our people. But you cannot push it indefinitely. You are unproductive, the country is great, but people come and hire you and pay you a million dollars and you don't have to work. Well, some, some, sometimes that happens in some places, but I don't think that that's possible in Singapore. So in the long term, that means that productivity has to go up. How does productivity go up? Education of our people, training of our people while they are working so that they, they, they learn skills which are relevant to their job. And also restructuring of the economy so that I keep on bringing in businesses which can, uh, uh, which, which are sunrise businesses and gradually phase out those which are not so successful and not so profitable. And then we can move. It's not magic, it's not easy, but it's the only way we can do it. One question before we go to the audience, Prime Minister. Uh, the theme of this uh, conference is the next horizon. You uh, mark this year as the 10th year you've been Prime Minister. Uh, next year, Singapore celebrates its 50th birthday. Uh, what have you learned? Uh, how have you evolved as a leader? How are you different today than 10 years ago? Where do you see yourself five years, 10 years from now? Well, before you retire. More gray hair today and even less hair in 10 years' time. <laughs>
vacuum, but what can you make possible beyond what we believe can be done? And then you do something a bit more. Whether it's the economy, whether it's education, whether it's the quality of the city we are building. I mean, we did not believe when we, 10 years ago, that Marina Bay would look like what it does today, anytime soon. We had an idea. And one year I actually showed uh, a visualization of what we hoped it would look like on our 50th birthday, which is next year. And there were some buildings up, but to make it look prettier and make sure it was convincing, I added some fireworks to animate the picture. And, well, we thought it looked good because it was a lot more than we had. But today, if you go around Marina Bay, even without fireworks, I think I'm proud of it. So, you can do more than you think is possible, and looking forward, beyond the 50th anniversary, I think that's what Singapore needs to do. To be aware, to be paranoid, so you always know that somebody can take your lunch away. But at the same time, you have the confidence that I have a good base, I am in a strong position, and I'm determined to do better. And I think that's what we need Singaporeans to think and to feel.